I will try today to uh, discuss with you um, this concept of uh, gyroscopes uh, based on laser light trapped in, in a crystal disk. Um, I will try to make it understandable by, by the general audience uh, without sacrificing too much to uh, the quality of, uh, of, the, of the science. Um, this is obviously a joint work uh, between uh, Fento Este uh, with myself, Laurent Larger, who actually uh, asked for this uh, eyesight uh, money, and uh, Romain Martinengi and Suleiman Diallo, who actually performed most of the experiments. Um, the real realization of the micro disks was actually, uh, in large parts, uh, subcontracted to uh, Jassem Safiwi at Fento Engineering. And of course, this is a joint uh, operation with uh, X-Blue Photonics, uh, represented here today by Henri Porte, uh, but also Jérôme Modin and uh, Aurore Ricardo. Uh, so this is an outline. Uh, I will try to keep it brief as far as the uh, state of the art is concerned. Um, it lies at the intersection of uh, two concepts. The first is uh, whispering Gary, Gary Mode's uh, resonators. I will try to describe this uh, rather rapidly. And the other concept is that of optical gyroscopes. Um, I will then go to describing what uh, the issues were at the beginning of, of this project towards combining these uh, two notions, two ideas of whispering gallery mode resonators and uh, optical gyroscopes. Uh, I will then discuss uh, what we managed to, to obtain during this uh, eyesight contract and uh, venture maybe a few um, innovations that could pursue, that could follow this project. Um, whispering gallery mode resonators um, are actually quite ancient. They've been observed uh, for quite a long time uh, in acoustics. Um, the name derives from uh, Cathedral St. Paul in, in London, uh, where uh, Lord Rayleigh, and amongst others, observed a very interesting acoustics phenomenon. Um, as you can see, this cathedral um, has a large dome, um, and under this dome, there's a circular gallery, and the uh, interesting acoustic phenomenon is that if you take place here and someone whispers at the diameter, opposite diameter of you, you will hear it in your own ear, just as if uh, this person was whispering right into your ear. Um, and Lord Rayleigh was actually the first to explain and describe quite in detail this uh, fascinating uh, phenomenon in 1895 and completed later on in, in 1918. Um, it should be pointed out that uh, to be non-European centric, uh, this phenomenon can be observed in actually six to seven places that I know of, uh, including in, in Peking, uh, the Temple of Heaven, where it can be uh, also observed. It, it's a bit farther, but still interesting. Um, in optics, uh, this phenomenon can be related to uh, diffusion, uh, and the Mie theory explains quite well how it behaves uh, when we switch from sound to optics. It describes in particular um, the diffusion phenomenon that can be observed in mist when light becomes trapped inside tiny droplets uh, of water and circulates, circulates, and then goes out, uh, giving rise to diffusion. So, it's a bit more recent, 1908. Um, the idea is that uh, light undergoes a successive total internal reflection inside the droplets before, uh, before going out. As far as uh, techniques, uh, science is concerned, um, artificial um, micro um, trapping of light can be observed in several ways. Uh, the it's more instinctive, more easy way to do it is actually to create a microbead in, in solid dielectrics, uh, for example, a bead of glass. And as we can see here, they manage to inject some light inside this microbead, and it circulates around the periphery, giving rise to this uh, quite nice um, pattern on the rim of, of the sphere. It can also be obtained um, using integrated optics, uh, for example, this racetrack, so called racetrack. Uh, waveguide. Uh, I think it's silicon over um, silicon. Oh. Well, it's integrated anyway. And this advantage here is that you can reach rather um, long distances, long circulation distances in a compact space. Um, another technique is also uh, illustrated here. It's uh, the so called micro roads, uh, where you can use, for example, laser machining to uh, etch grooves 
in the surface of here, it's uh, actually um, an optical fiber. And these grooves will um, trap the light pretty much in the same way it would be trapped in this kind of bead. Um, our expertise at, uh, at Fento ST, and this is what I, I will focus on in, in the next uh, few slides, uh, we try to focus on uh, discs, millimeter sized discs. Uh, of course, you can realize such discs uh, in a variety of materials. They can either be amorphous, mostly glasses, uh, which can be doped or not, uh, but it's another subject. We focused on uh, crystal discs. Again, there's a whole range of uh, materials available for your consideration here. Um, our main uh, goal was to actually um, get an expertise in producing discs um, of fluorides. So there's, these are the materials uh, we have um, encountered out of this, this uh, uh, it's BAF2 here, sorry about the, the mistype. Um, anyway, we have approached and actually managed to um, produce discs in all of these uh, materials in the last uh, 10 years. Um, so to go into a bit more into detail on how we do this and what we can do here at, uh, at Fento ST, uh, so far the production mechanism was uh, purely mechanical. As you can see on this picture here, it's pretty much uh, like a lathe. Uh, we have this uh, preform, this uh, stub of disc, and we have it rotate at fairly high speed and then there's mechanical uh, abrasion uh, here during the first uh, stage, the most time consuming and more risky stage. And the polishing stage then takes place with a, a piece of felt and uh, with a polishing compound uh, imprinted on, on it. Um, when we started this uh, project, it was still quite painful and time consuming, taking about two to three days for just one disc. Um, obviously, you cannot parallel process this thing. You, we have only one setup, so you have to take the time it takes. Um, but still, again, we managed to um, process uh, all kinds of uh, fluorid crystals. Um, once you have manufactured your disc, you obviously want to qualify it. And we have access to uh, a lot of technologies to do that. Uh, first, uh, observation, microscopic uh, observation, either th through a scanning electron microscope or profilometry to assess the surface roughness of um, our uh, disks. Uh, the next step, step would be to try and inject light in this disk. The easier way to do this consists in using a very thin, um, narrowed, tapered fiber, inject light in it, and hope that the light goes inside, inside the disk. Uh, this has been performed with green lights just for the sake of demonstration, uh, but uh, we, of course, for uh, um, telecom reasons, work at 1550 nanometers. So here, what, here, this is what happens when your disk is quite nice. You see that light goes in and it goes round, round, round inside the disk. Um, if we try to put a bit more uh, science in this, uh, this disk behaves actually like a Fabry-Perot reflector. Uh, it won't let light go in unless you are very close to a resonance, uh, a bit more, a bit like what John explained uh, early uh, yesterday morning. So this translates in this curve here uh, as a resonance curve. Basically, uh, when you are not at a resonance, light just does not come in. Here we scan in frequency, and you can see that uh, there's regularly some dips in the transmission curve, which means light is allowed to go in. And when, we see, when you see this kind of, uh, of curve with your disk, you are pretty happy. You, can, you know that it's a rather nice uh, experiment. We have uh, also other uh, things to characterize. Um, one in particular allows us uh, to put a figure on the quality of this disk, um, namely the quality factor, uh, which is the resonance frequency divided by the, uh, the line width of, of the this disk. Um, when we started this project, 10 to the eighth Q factor was our uh, routine, and obviously the goal was to improve on that. And we'll see we, we were not too unsuccessful in that. Um, as far as uh, the nonlinear regime is concerned, we also have a lot of uh, expertise in that in qualifying the nonlinear uh, coefficients of this disk. Um, 
No, the other part of, um, of our goal here is to apply these um, whispering galley mode resonators to the concept of optical gyroscopes. Optical gyroscopes, in principle, uh, rely on the Sagnac effect. The Sagnac effect uh, basically describes what happens when you have, for example, a, a circular uh, element in rotation in, uh, with an omega uh, proper rotation. And this, uh, in a relativistic term, means that the light propagating in one direction will see a different time of light compared to the light propagating in the other direction. Um, this is not new. This has been applied for quite some time and with a lot of success by X-Blue, for example. And uh, as you can see, this illustrates the whole family of um, optics-based gyroscopes. Um, this also illustrates the fact that um, there's quite a market, uh, there's quite an interest in industrial development of such gyroscopes, um, with room left here for uh, intermediate value uh, development. The principle is as illustrated here. You inject light in your, uh, in your disks in both directions. One of the outputs is actually uh, used to synchronize, to um, adjust the laser wavelength to one of the resonances, one that will circulate in one direction. And the readout signal is actually uh, the signal at the other, in the other direction. And if you are locked at one frequency, you, you apply modulation on the other uh, direction, and uh, rotation will translate in the modification in the contrast, in the modulation contrast at the readout because there would be an asymmetry, a difference of symmetry uh, in the modulation you apply on, uh, on your um, test signal. Um, so why, I, why are uh, Whisper and Gallimode resonators interesting in this kind of context? Uh, the main idea is to replace uh, a few hundred meters of fiber by a 12 millimeter sized disc, uh, which is a huge improvement in compactness as well as uh, stability and other uh, manufacturing techniques. Um, and this can be at the cost of lowered performance, considering uh, the cost would also get a bit lower. Uh, what um, impedes this application so far is uh, when we begin this project that uh, the discs were largely handmade, uh, which was very time consuming. There was a lot of, uh, of break during the early stage of, of production and the reproducibility by, by the fact that it's actually very, very much handmade uh, was not so good. Uh, another issue was the uh, coupling of light inside the disk. Um, this tapered fiber thing, uh, keep in mind that you have to be some tens of nanometers away from the disk. And if you get too, too, too far, you lose coupling. How much time do I have? Four One minute? One minute. Oh, okay. So I think I took a lot of time for the state of the art. So I will go very fast on the results. Uh, we managed to uh, fasten, to, to have a much faster um, processing rate during the disk manufacturing. We could cut down our manufacturing time to one full day by having the early stage, the first stage of manufacturing performed by a femtosecond laser. Uh, as you can see the results is quite nice as far as the geometry is concerned. Uh, concerning our prism coupling, um, we now uh, manage to have this uh, glued disc uh, using prism coupling, and it's very rugged. It's, um, it's been stable for the last eight months. As we could see uh, during the confinement, uh, we have detrimental, um, well, we have, a, that's an advantage to this uh, lockdown thing. We could see that it didn't move for the like next month. Uh, and we also observed that we couldn't reach now the very, the very same coupling quality with taper and fiber. Uh, what's left to do uh, so far is to improve on disk polishing. We would try and have a full laser polishing to remove all mechanical operations and have um, a higher quality and faster processing. And we also would like to uh, build a demonstrator, uh, perform stress tests on the glued uh, prisms, and perhaps improve also on the global architecture of the gyro system to benefit of higher sensitivities. 
Um, and that's the conclusion slide, so perhaps uh, I can thank you for your attention. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, we have time for your one, one question or two questions. Yeah, upstairs. Ah, that, that's a very good question. Um, the question is about uh, using whispering gallium mode disks to improve the sensitivity of spectroscopic uh, readings, if I'm correct, yes. Um, yeah, that's something I think we should dis discuss together because uh, I think there's potential in microstructuring or texturing disks in order to perhaps um, either characterize the material in itself, which is what I think you suggested, or perhaps also have microstructured disks where you could uh, inject or let flow uh, fluids or gases and see perhaps some kind of response on that. And to answer your question, yes, there would be an increase in sensitivity because you would decrease your line width uh, as much as the quality factor goes up. So I think, yes, there's an interest in that. Can you put one in the up? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, there would be thermal effects to be considered and um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's interesting, so we, we should keep in touch. <laughs> okay, so we are a little bit late regarding the break, so we are going to thank you again. Mm -hmm.